We give you thanks, God, for this morning, this day, in which we gather in this place, truly as we are blessed. We ask, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak and move in our midst, that as we go from this place, whether we're participating online or in this very room, that we would go forth as agents of your mercy and grace because we have been blessed. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people together said, Amen. 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 Well, it's good to see all of you this morning, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or whether you're joining us online, uh, either while the service is happening live or maybe watching later in the, the week. We're just so blessed to have you a part of this worshiping community here today. We're continuing in a series of messages called Way Makers, and it's about how God makes a way in our life to live and to love differently, perhaps, than we have known that we ever could. And today we're going to turn our attention to the next in the order of Beatitudes of Jesus, these statements of blessing by Jesus that are in Matthew's Gospel in Matthew chapter 5. Now before I talk about the Beatitude today, I, I, I have a confession to make and I want to be really clear about my confession that when I was a, a, a very young man, I learned how to drive in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, we're trained to drive aggressive and fast. So when I'm home in L.A., when I get on the freeway at anything less than 60 miles an hour, it's a turtle. I have been born and raised to drive too fast, too often. And so what I've noticed over the years as I've moved from city to city along the West Coast, um, I found myself in San Diego. And in San Diego, people drive differently than L.A. A lot of people think San Diego is the backyard of Los Angeles. Incorrect. San Diego is a city unto itself with its own culture. And one of the driving idiosyncrasies of San Diego is that when a San Diego driver wants to make a right-hand turn, they get as far over to the left as they can before they turn right. It stops the entire right lane while we wait for the driver to make this big, wide, sweeping turn. And so I've lived in Sacramento. I've driven around the Bay Area. It has its idiosyncrasies. And then I moved to Seattle. And upon arriving in Seattle, I've discovered that as I'm driving around the city, I haven't found a speed limit sign higher than 40. No matter where I go, 40 is it. So you can imagine what it's like being born and raised to drive a car in Los Angeles and you come to Seattle and you can't really drive the car, even in my own neighborhood, every street, even if it's an arterial street, 25 miles an hour. How have you all done it for so long? I don't know. But what I can tell you is I am at my most merciless is when I'm behind the wheel of a car. There's something about driving around three or four tons that suddenly turns us from Mr. Hyde to Dr. Jekyll or Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. I don't know which way it goes, but there's something about that experience. So today we're talking about mercy and me at my most merciless. So pray, pray to the Lord that I never end up behind you. And if I do end up behind you, pray for my soul. Pray for my soul. Pray for my sanctification in that moment, friends. This notion of mercy is hard for us to get a hold of. We live in a culture where people get what they deserve, and they get what they had coming. And what we find in the economy of mercy is that we get something we didn't deserve, and we actually receive something that we didn't expect coming. It's very much the opposite we live in a culture that loves retaliation and retribution. Three of the top ten grossing movies of all time are called Avengers. There's something about us that likes this notion of people getting what they deserve. Or at least as we think it to be true. This last week, the actor Ashley Judd uh, was on a podcast in which she speaks about a moment in her life that happened in 1999 when she was assaulted by a man. 
And just recently, she had an opportunity to sit down with that man who had assaulted her back in 1999. And she describes the conversation that occurred on a front porch in a very interesting way. She said, my conversation with my assailant was restorative. Have you ever heard that word before, restorative? It was a remarkable commentary. I encourage you to just Google or go search for the podcast of Ashley Judd podcast or restorative. She tells such an amazing story about this conversation she had that was so filled with mercy, so filled with grace, so filled with forgiveness that for me it was just a, just a witness to a person's strength of character and courage. It epitomized, I think, what Jesus is telling us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Or your Bible translation in the pew phrases it this way. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. This is one of the most unusual statements Jesus makes in all of the Beatitudes or these statements of blessing because it's reciprocal. Do you see it? Blessed are those who receive mercy, who are merciful because they will receive mercy. You see how you get back, in a sense, the mercy? It's the only beatitude where the, the statement of being and the statement of blessing are exactly the same. They're both about mercy. Now that word in that particular text in Matthew chapter 5, it doesn't mean merciful acts. It means having a character or a virtue of mercy in one's life. And so it's that character or that virtue that produces an abundance of acts that are merciful. And this is in some way where um, this particular text runs afoul to the random act of kindness. The random act of kindness, even the way we describe it, it's like a one-off, isn't it? So it's almost the way we talk about it is like, well, we typically don't practice kindness, but today I'm going to make an exception and I'm going to practice this one random act of kindness done. What Jesus begs us into is something a little, a little bit deeper that forms us, that takes shape in our lives. I'm going to invite Pastor Bonnie Brand to come, and she is going to read to us a very familiar text. You already heard it this morning in the kids' camp moment. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan, a well-known text in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, quite likely the most famous story Jesus ever told. Come on, Pastor, and let's hear this great text from Luke chapter 10. So, as Pastor Craig mentioned, our scripture for this morning is found in Luke 10, 25 through 37, from the CEB Bible is what I'll be reading, and if you want to follow along, it's on page 1263, or on the screen. A legal expert stood up to the test to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove he was right, so he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was going down along the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came to that spot, saw the injured man, crossed over to the other side of the road and went his way. A Samaritan who was on a journey came to where this man was. But when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return I will pay you back for any additional costs. 
What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Now, a question I meant to ask you before we heard the scripture reading, and thank you, Pastor Bonnie. Nancy, I'm going to have you put it up on the screen. Here's the question I want you to be wondering about, not only now, but perhaps during the week. What are some actions today which indicate a merciful person? Don't think about an act of mercy. Think about a merciful person. And how have those been evident in your life? In other words, how have some of those actions of a merciful person been present in your life? Let's talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I need about three or four hours to get through this parable. Is that okay with you all? Okay, we may not have that much time. It starts off with this question, who is my neighbor? It seems like an innocuous enough question, doesn't it? The, the Jewish religious leader, he's, he's a, an expert in the Jewish law, asks this question, who is my neighbor? But I want you to hear what's implied in the question. What's implied in the question is that there's then somebody who is my neighbor and there's somebody who is not my neighbor. And so what the legal expert is asking Jesus to do is to tell him, how can I tell the difference between a person who's my neighbor and who's my not, who's not my neighbor? Do you sense the narcissism in the question? How can I tell who is going to benefit me? And how can I tell who's going to be a liability to me? How do I separate those apart? So the way the scholar even approaches the question is from the standpoint of their own perspective. Who is my neighbor? And so then Jesus tells the story that we all know so well of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The story takes place on a road that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is a too small picture of what that looks like. I took this picture back in 2017 in the Holy Land. And you can see, I even got somebody's, oh, you can't see it. I think he blocked it out. There's a finger in the picture. My wife is laughing over there because we accidentally got a finger in the picture when we took it. This is a picture of that road. Now remember, the parable of the Good Samaritan didn't historically happen, got it? Because it's a parable of the Good Samaritan, right? But this is the road Jesus is talking about. This road is 17 miles long. It connects Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho is down in the Jordan River Valley. Jerusalem is up in the mountains. It's a 3,330 ele foot elevation change between the two, over 17 miles. So if you want to take that trip, it consumes most of the day for a person to do so. And it was not uncommon for people to go back and forth, especially for priests and Levites. Many of the priests and Levites in Jesus' day lived in Jericho, and they went to the temple up in Jerusalem, and they would do their shift, if you will. Most priests had a one-month shift out of the year, so they would go to Jerusalem, work for a month, and go home for the other 11 months. Levites would have a, a similar but a little bit more frequent schedule, usually one or two weeks a month they would go up to Jerusalem and then go home. So this was a, a freeway, if you will, that went back and forth, but I hope maybe what you can see in the picture is how desolate it is. There are no shrubs that grow there, there are no trees that grow there, not until you get up toward Jerusalem do you get some trees. It looks like a moonscape that connects these two cities, and Jesus places the story on a road that everybody was familiar with. And it wasn't uncommon for people to get robbed on this road. Lots of twists and turns, so it was easy for those people who would be called robbers to hide and you know, to assault somebody on the road. And in this case, they assault a man. Jesus doesn't tell us who the man is. But the man who's assaulted is the most important person in the story because the story is told from that man's perspective. It's not told from the perspective of the Samaritan. It's told from the perspective of the man who was assaulted and left for dead on the side of the road. And so there are three individuals who come by. Individual number one, a priest. So the priest, who's going about their priestly duties at the temple in Jerusalem, sees the man on the side of the road, and he walks by on the other side. The text doesn't tell us why he walks by on the other side. It doesn't explain anything about why he walks by on the other side, only that he sees the guy and he walks by on the other side. There are any number of reasons he could have done so. The priest could have thought he was dead. And if that was the case, if the priest touched him, he would be ritually unclean for 14 days. 
and he would be placed on the injured reserved list for his duties at the temple. Uh, the priest could have thought that if I stop and help him, then I'm going to be encumbered financially or my time or something. The, the individual is going to consume something from me. And so instead of having that consumption happen, the priest just walks by on the other side. And then along comes a Levite right after that. And the Levite is um, a member of the priestly household. So I'll try to explain it. Every priest is a Levite, but not every Levite is a priest. How's that? Does that work? So the Levite is associated with the work of the priest. The Levite does the exact same thing. Sees the man injured on the road, walks by on the other side. So if you're there listening to the story and you hear about the priest and the Levite both walking by on the other side, if you're listening to Jesus, you're thinking, oh, I know where this is going to go. He's going to tell a story that makes all the religious leaders look bad. And if that were the case, the third person to walk by would be like a Jewish layman, right? Here are these two clerics that came by and did nothing, and then along comes a Jewish layman, and he's the one who helps. If that were the case, this story would be a story that's indicting the religious leadership of Jesus' day, the priests and the Levites. But Jesus doesn't pick a Jewish layperson, does he? He doesn't pick a Jewish woman, does he? He doesn't pick a Jewish slave, does he? Who does he pick? He picks a Samaritan, of all people. Now, this is where the three-hour sermon comes in. For me to explain why Samaritans and Jews hate each other would take about that long. Just suffice to say, trust me on this one, they hate each other. And it's a long and complicated story that lasts for 500 years, why they hate each other. They can't stand each other. If you were a Jew, you would rather spend time with a Gentile Roman than you would with a Samaritan. Because at least a Roman is a Gentile. A Samaritan is a duplicitous betrayer. See the difference? It's really hard for us to understand in 21st century United States the complexity of this story. Jesus selects for his third person the most offensive person he could pick. It would have been better for a person with leprosy to have come by the road than a Samaritan. That's how the Jews held the Samaritans in such ill regard. The Samaritan is in the story to shock you. So let's imagine for a moment out here on 3rd Avenue, a person is assaulted and is left on the sidewalk and is bleeding and is about to die. A police officer walks by, sees the man wounded on the side of the road, and goes to the other side of 3rd Avenue to walk around him. And then right after that, a firefighter is coming down the street with everyone who's working on the fire truck and they see the person injured on the side of the road. They stop the fire, cr- fire truck. They turn on Dravis to go around the man injured on the street. And then an EMT came down the street and saw the injured man on the side of the road and did absolutely nothing to help him. This gives you some sense of the cultural context. Do you want me to fill in who could possibly be the Samaritan for us? I'm going to let you imagine who that would be. The reason is, is because that person is a little bit different for each one of us, isn't it? And in a sense, our capacity to identify that person, to visualize that person just for a moment betrays our mercilessness. This is what Jesus was trying to convey to the people who heard the story. I want you not to hear the story and put it in your head. I want you to feel the story in your heart. Think of the most offensive, scandalous person you know. You can possibly associate culturally or personally. That's the person. It's reorienting, isn't it? to sit in the emotional space that we find there. Now, Pastor Stephanie, she's got it together because she told you a very important part of the story that I want you to hear. It bears repeating what she said. I want you to notice at the end of the story how Jesus turns the tables. Remember turning the tables that she talked about in the kids camp message? The turning of the tables here is that the lawyer asked Jesus what? Who is my neighbor? And what does Jesus say? Which of these three was that man's neighbor? 
So Jesus changes the question, what defines a neighbor? What defines a neighbor? So let me leave you with that question for a moment. What defines a neighbor? Hmm. The unexpected neighbor is in the story to shock us. Isn't it quiet in this room right now? It's there to shock us so that when we grab a hold of the story, we go, my word, Jesus has done something to me and in me. We also learn that mercy is extravagant and universal. What does the Samaritan do? Does the Samaritan just give the guy a Band-Aid? Does the Samaritan give him a random act of kindness? No, what does the Samaritan do? Pours olive oil and wine on his wounds, which they use that for medicinal purposes in the time of Jesus as well for a variety of other uses. He puts him on his animal. He takes him to an inn. He gets him in a room. He makes sure he's fed. He gives the innkeeper a bunch of money and says, take care of this guy. And if he costs any more than the amount I've given you, I'll come back. What makes the story so bizarre at that point is there's absolutely no reason a Samaritan would be on that road. A Samaritan would never travel from Jericho to Jerusalem or back on that road. That road runs east and west from Jerusalem down to Jericho. The Samaritans live far to the north. There's no reason he'd ever be on that road, much the less he would never be back on that road. There's not an occasion in which that Samaritan needs to go back by that inn to pay. So that means when the Samaritan says, if it costs any more, I'll come back and pay you, what is the Samaritan doing? The Samaritan is saying, I'm going to go out of my way. Several days' journey to come back here to make sure that you, the innkeeper, are paid for whatever this man cost you. That is no random act of kindness, is it? That's an intentional, constructive act of a mercy. And the last thing we need to mention here is that everybody listening to Jesus is filled with privilege. And that privilege blinds the expected neighbor. In other words, privilege keeps people from seeing the unexpected neighbor all around us. Because we're so conditioned to think things come to us a certain way that when things don't come to us that way, we're not sure what to do with it. We don't know how to file it, in a sense. More on that in a moment. Let me give you this question to wonder about. How has an act of mercy surprised you? And how has it changed you? Have you ever been the recipient of a surprise act of mercy before? In other words, not getting what you deserved. Has that ever happened to you? What was it like in that moment? Have you ever given someone an act of mercy, some, given to another person something they did not deserve? And what was it like for you in that moment? How did it change you, whether you were on the receiving end or the, the giving end of it? Let's talk for a moment about how this text is alive in us. The first thing I would share with you is this, is that mercifulness starts a chain reaction. So when the priest and the Levite see the guy on the side of the road, they immediately see in the man who's injured a giant minus sign. All they can see is what they might lose if they do anything. We could lose money, we could lose our time, we could lose our energy and effort, we could lose our reputation, we could lose our ritual cleanliness, we could lose all of that. So when they see the man, all they see is This is not a mathematical equation that works well for us. We're going to lose if we help this guy. And what they find out is that their avoidance of the subtraction for themselves creates a subtraction for the man who's injured, right? That the potential for aid and rescue and help walked right by on the other side. Remember the importance of reading the story from the perspective of the man in the ditch? The priest and the Levite were saving themselves from the big minus. But the big minus was really endured by the injured man. His opportunity to be saved was lost. So Jesus is saying that there's something about mercy that starts a chain reaction. So what do you suppose the man who is injured, what do you think he'll do because he was the recipient of mercy? Do you think that someday he might try to be merciful himself because he'll reflect on that act of mercy he received? He might. What do you think about the innkeeper who had a Samaritan show up in his lobby? 
that has maps, by the way. I don't know if you saw in the video. He's got maps in his lobby. Shows up in the innkeeper's lobby and says, I'll be back to pay you anything that he owes, knowing that it's way out of the way for the Samaritan to do that. Do you see what happens with mercy? Mercy becomes an act which multiplies. It has an exponential potential. So when we put mercy out there, it's going to grow and it's going to flourish and it's going to multiply in a variety of places. So it's not a big minus sign, is it? It's actually a big multiplication sign. Mercy takes off when we practice it. The second thing that I think we can take away from this story is that exclusion is a death-dealing posture. Exclusion is a death-dealing posture. In this story, literally, when the priest and the Levite say, nope, we're not going to help, there's an exclusionary act that happens, and that's a death-dealing posture. In doing so, the man who's injured on the side of the road takes one more click toward death, doesn't he? One more click, one more click, one more click. And what I mean by this is that something I read by Heinrich Grieven, one of the scholars I was reading to try to prepare for the message today, he says this, One cannot define one's neighbor. One can only be a neighbor. I'll read that again. One cannot define one's neighbor. One can only be a neighbor. The third thing this story reveals to us is nothing reveals God's character more than love revealed in mercy. We Methodists have a word we use to talk about this. You all saw the sign when you came in today? Free Methodist Church. Saw that? To be Methodist means that we're believers in the prevenient grace of God. And so you say to yourself, what in the world is the prevenient grace of God? I'm going to pull the room. If you're at home, don't stress. But I'm going to pull the room. How many of you know what prevenient grace is? Good, 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 good. What prevenient grace is, it's it's the belief that we have as Methodists that God's grace is at work in people's lives before they're even aware of it. So that God is already at work in human beings and stirring and moving in their heart and soul even when they have no awareness of it. And that the job of prevenient grace is to move us forward in our spiritual life toward justification and sanctification. And guess who is the recipient of God's prevenient grace according to the Wesleyan tradition? The correct answer is everyone. Everyone is the recipient of God's grace. So when I'm in San Diego driving behind that guy who wants to make a right turn from as far left as they possibly can, yes, even they are a recipient of the prevenient grace of God. It's a reorienting for us to think about it as Methodist people that every human being you interact with has God's grace upon them because the image of God is in them. Every human being is sacred. So every moment in which we try to form judgment, which we try to condemn, that's a losing battle because God's grace is upon every single human being. Our Reformed brothers and sisters talk about unconditional election. As if there's some way everyone who's going to heaven, God decided, and everyone who's not, well, God decided that too. We as Methodists reject such notions. We believe that God's grace is on everyone. Everyone. And that triggers a mercy response in us. And the fourth thing I think we can learn from this text is that assume you yourself are in the posture of need. I'm keenly aware of this when I'm driving an automobile. Or at least I need to be more keenly aware of it when I'm driving an automobile. That I myself am in need. If I have a hard time being merciful when I'm behind the wheel of a car, do you suppose it might be harder for me to be merciful when someone really hurts me? Do you suppose that if I have a hard time formulating mercy for some anonymous person in a crosswalk or behind the wheel of a car or standing behind the cashier counter at some store, if I have a hard time formulating mercy for those people that I don't know, that I haven't interacted with, that they haven't actually done anything to me, how much harder is it going to be for me to have mercy on someone who does deep traumatic damage to me? Pray for me. What's the promise of the first beatitude? Do you remember? 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's our starting point, isn't it? So friends, let me just finish with this. Here's a question for you to wonder about. Who needs a neighbor in your life this week? Because we don't get to decide who a neighbor is. We only get to decide whether we're going to be one or not. So, if we're going to make a mistake this week, and everyone in this room, we're all going to make a mistake this week, aren't we? May we make our mistake on the side of mercy, grace, forgiveness, kindness, love. If we're going to be guilty of anything, let us be guilty of those things. Guilty is charged. Let's pray. We thank you for the witness of mercy, O God. And so we stand together as your people this morning, making a unified confession that we are recipients of your mercy, that we have not received from your hand what we deserve, but that you have dispensed upon us infinite love and grace. And so as we come before this table now for communion, to share together in the Lord's Supper, remind us deeply of how much we need you and how much every single human life needs you. For you alone have the words of life. Bless us as we gather around this table now. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) 